Hello and welcome to today's daily news analysis. So today is 24th of May 2022. We are covering the Hindu newspapers Delhi edition. Now these are the topics that I have identified that can be helpful for both prelims as and mains and I'll keep guiding you as to how to go about it. Now coming to the first article. First of all, our prime minister is in Tokyo and a summit was going on which was being led by US president Biden. So here in the summit India has decided to join Biden's new trade initiative. So we should know what is this new trade initiative, which is for the Indo-Pacific region. So just for clarity's sake, this is the Indo-Pacific region over here, this entire region. And uh, this is the map of Trans-Pacific Partnership Nations. Right? So this region. So this initiative is known as the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework for Prosperity. So we can write it in short, IPEF. So Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, some set of rules, some set of uh, guide guidelines according to which the countries should work together to strengthen economic ties. So it will strengthen economic ties as the United States says, but it clarifies that this is not a free trade deal or a free trade agreement between the nations. Now you can see the definition of free trade agreement over here. It basically means that uh, the countries of a particular region, they come together and they say that we will encourage free trade. We will not uh, provide barriers, you know, when one country trades against the other. So typically there will be barriers to trade. Naturally, if uh, um, Singapore or Japan is exporting too much into Australia, Australia will have to shell out money for that. The Australians would be losing job. So hypothetically speaking, so therefore there are barriers. So free trade agreement is about removing those barriers to trade. This could be barriers in the form of tariff, like uh, anything that comes from Japan or Vietnam to Australia, they will be taxed at a higher rate. So custom duties, or it could be like, we don't like the quality of this thing or so and so, so and so items cannot be imported into a country. So, so these are non-tariff barriers. So it is nothing of that sort. It is not a free trade agreement. They are not talking about reducing tariffs or increasing market access. No. All they are talking about is that they want this uh, USA and this countries of this region to work on these four priority areas. And what are these? So first is trade. Second is supply chain resiliency. Clean energy and decarbonization. Taxes and anti-corruption measures or regulatory measures. Now, I think all of it you can make sense. But supply chain resiliency is important because this draws my attention. Uh, it draws my attention due to a reason actually. You know, recently we had the shortage of sub, uh, semiconductors and many other commodities actually. So this happened because of this environment induced by the COVID. So there was this shortage of semiconductors that hampered the automobile industry, the electronics in industry, mobile manufacturing variables, you name it. Likewise, there may be more such scenarios where the supply chain would be disrupted and it would affect the overall economy. So that is one thing. So the country should work together on that. The countries have their respective competencies and make sure that the supply chain doesn't stop. Second, there are certain countries. There are certain countries uh, which are trying to create a monopoly. By the way, nothing of this sort is written anywhere. So China has a monopoly on, let's say, the rare earths. So they are critical for number of strategic things like manufacturing of semiconductors, defense equipments, you name it. It's required for that. So they are having this monopoly over here. And tomorrow they say that, you know, they don't like something of USA and they would say that we will not provide you the raw materials or the PCBs that the China, China makes, we will not provide you, end of it, end of story. So, so avoid such things. So that is again one more uh, reason, because you see supply chain resiliency has been mentioned at the first point. Okay, then we can also correlate uh, with this thing that China has been more and more assertive 
territorially in the recent times. For example, them claiming the entire South China Sea. They say that it is a nine dash line according to an ancient map. Map. This area belongs to them. So let's say if this area belongs to them, and they say that no ships will go to the USA from this region or any other country for that matter. So it is hampering free navigation. Navigation of uh, goods, navigation of trade, and this is a barrier. This is a supply chain issue. So this is again how you can correlate over here. So India has decided to join this initiative. Okay. So this is it. Uh, this is about this article, and it tells us about the size or the heft of this grouping. So it includes uh, seven out of ten Asian members are part of this. So we have uh, China, uh, countries that are close to China. So China is not part of it. Myanmar, Cambodia, and Laos. So these countries are not members of the Indo-Pacific. This agreement over here, Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. Now, if you got it, please click on the like button. Now, as as I said, Prime Minister Modi is in uh, Tokyo, which you can make out. So, Prime Minister Modi here met Japanese industry leaders, right? We have a lot of Japanese companies like Maruti, Yamaha, I think Panasonic. So, a so lot of companies are there who are Japanese companies who are coming to our country. So, he says, why don't you invest more? We are doing a lot of things like uh, ease of doing business. Uh, we are making this uh, our country as uh, friendly for re regulatory purposes you just come we have ready and labor we have land acquisition no problem everything you just come make investments to our country and everything will be sorted that is what he would be saying okay so that is one thing second thing if you notice over here it says uniqlo some japanese industrialist retailer actually like big bazaar etc so invited to join india's journey in becoming a tech enabled manufacturing hub for the textiles so they are talking about the textile sector. Now why is Prime Minister Modi talking about textile? Why doesn't he say some other sector? Why textile only? That is something that you should consider. So textile, it is said that textile sector requires less, in, less investment. It is less capital in, uh, intensive as compared to automobile company. So if 30, th th thousands and thousands of crores are being used for creating a plant, manufacturing unit, of an automobile car, textile would require much lesser investment. Textile is labor intensive. So more jobs will be created. And where are these jobs created? In the formal sector. And most of these jobs go to the women. So these are the kind of jobs that the economy wants. And that is why the textile sector. Now he says that we have undertaken certain reforms like the PM Mitra scheme. I want you to read by yourself and I want you to go to the Ministry of Textile. This will help you with your problems. And there go to the scheme section and click you will get the list of measures that the government has taken. Now I, I believe that textile sector, you know, we can correlate uh, GS1 geography, uh, factors responsible for location of industries. So on those lines as to uh, textile sector, then uh, what are the issues and challenges and what measures are being undertaken. So that is a mains based thing and for pre you have it with you. If you study about the schemes also, you will be able to easily do it. But you have to do it yourself. So this we are done. Now US, US was also there, right? So we will have some bath cheat. We will talk together. So US and India had a kind of an agreement known as the Investment Incentive Agreement. And what was that about? It was signed between the foreign secretaries of both the countries or similar ranked officer from USA. And they say that uh, it is this U United States, there is this uh, entity known as Development Finance Corporation. So this will be providing funding into India. So this will be provided, funding will be provided into India, into sectors specifically that were affected by the COVID-19. So COVID-19 related measures like healthcare, healthcare financing, etc. So funding will be provided for that. And this is a legal obligation after this treaty has been signed. And I don't know why, but USA will sign it. So there must be a reason India must have given certain concessions, which is not mentioned in this article over here. 
Now coming to the next article, so we get two things uh, over here. One is green hydrogen, uh, obviously not mentioned in this article. So green hydrogen, why do we want it? Why is it important? What is the government doing about it? So those things from the mains point of view. And from prelims point of view, there is a mention of the World Economic Forum at Davos, Switzerland. Okay, so this is there. Now you should know about this World Economic Forum, the reports that are released by this. UPC is, loves this topic, World Economic Forum. Time and again they ask questions particularly about the reports over here. And these reports actually uh, you can use it in your answer rating as well. For example, there is a report known as the Global Gender Gap Report published by WEF. So you get to know, okay, fine, uh, what is the issue of the gender gap in a country? You have a credible fact. It improves or enhances the quality of your answers when you do that. So we're done with this WEF. Now let's move on to the green hydrogen. By the way, we have a very detailed video, 10, 15, 20, 12 minutes say, so with, in which I have explained green hydrogen and green economy. So briefly, it is about water. So water, from water we get hydrogen. But uh, it's not that simple, right? It is not that simple. So some force has to be applied to split water from uh, into hydrogen and oxygen. So that force is known as electrolysis. So some by electrolysis, we get, we split H2O into H2O and O2. Simple. Okay. Now this electrolysis, naturally as the name goes, electrolysis, some electricity is required for that. So if the electricity is coming from the renewables, so that is known as the green hydrogen. It's a clean thing. Why is it important? Because renewables, if you see, they are, they are not steady source of electricity. We don't have sunlight all through the 24 hours. So after the morning, there is night also. We need electricity back then also. But we do not have mechanisms of storing the electricity. We need those batteries and those batteries are not very environment friendly also. We need that. So what do we do about it? So we can use water to store electricity in the form of hydrogen. And uh, hydrogen can be used in two ways. One is hot combustion, like flaming, you know, putting gas, uh, putting fire to gas and you get that combustion like a rocket. So that is one thing, it's unsafe. The other thing is a safer model that is known as the cold combustion, which is also known as the fuel cell technology, hydrogen based fuel cells. There are cars that are based on hydrogen based fuel cell. So it can be used as a source of electricity or energy. Anyhow, you could have it in the, the houses, it could be in the automobile, it could be in aviation, you name it. Next article, world may have lost 11.2 crore jobs. Who says this? International Labour Organization. And what is International Labour Organization? It is a specialized agency of the United Nations. Now I can keep going on and on. So what is the specialized agency of the United Nations that you see, that you read for yourself and it's very easy to get from the Wikipedia. So world may have lost 11.2 crore jobs and we have a problem of unemployment in our country, right? And what do we do with this 11.2 crore jobs the world has lost, right? There is a crisis across the world, but we have to be focused on India. So with reference to India, they say, they say that obviously Indians have lost jobs, unemployment rate has increased and uh, here they are saying that uh, there are two things, large number of Indians also have lost their jobs. So they are giving us some indication as with reference to the women also that who have lost jobs over here. So they say with for every 100 women, 12.3 women have lost their job due to the pandemic. That's a pandemic, post pandemic, this scenario. And for men, it is at 7.5. So for every 100 people, 100 uh, male members, 7.5 so 7.5 have lost their job so it says that it shows that uh, women have lost more number of jobs as compared to the men right so women have lost so if you see this way we can say that the gender gap in the labor sector has widened because of it so women have lost more uh, jobs in more greater proportion as compared to the men over here now read this World Economic Forum thing. 
So global gender gap report 2021 published by World Economic Forum. It says India ranks 140 out of 156. Now your job is to find out what parameters have been taken into consideration for global gender gap reports. So this you should find for yourself. Okay. Gender gap is increasing. We get this. Why is this a problem, a matter of concern? What can the government do about it? And likewise, labor force participation, labor force participation rate amongst the women, women participating in the workforce has coming down quite evident from here. Why? Second, what can the government do? So think from a policy perspective, you are wanting to join this. So think from a policy perspective as to what steps can be taken and why do we want more participation of women in the workforce clear so now we can gs3 more of gs3 part of gs1 when we are gender to it so that way we can look at it now coming to the next article this is about uh, fertility rate that is obviously it's about uh, family planning it's about population control so in very brief this article is saying that uh, it's starting with this thing that our total fertility rate uh, total fertility rate means on an average a woman a woman in the foot when she can give a birth so she is giving birth to how many children so if, if it says it is giving birth to 3. Point, earlier it was giving birth to 3.4 children 3.4 that means around 3 to 4 children per woman so this was in 1990s but now we have come to 2.0 according to the national family health survey so 2.2 now if you want to control a population or we want to make the population as constant we don't want it to fall down also we, we don't want goes down so we create it so for that, the fertility rate uh, is known as the replacement level, that the population that dies, the new population is filling that gap. So that is at 2.1 children per woman. So 2.1. So we have come down as compared because we can see it from the uh, National Family Health Survey. We don't have the census and census is quite outdated actually. So we are using the census of 2011. The most recent one is yet to come. It has been delayed by the pandemic. Clear? So 2.1. And by the way, religion wise also speaking, all communities are more or less close only, right? So some people, bad name has been given as nothing like that. If you look at go by the religion wise fertility rate. Okay. So what it is saying is that uh, fine, we have done great work on the fertility rate, but we need to focus not just on adults like married couples but we should also look at the younger population so that is very very important so as is seen with uh, Tripura and Meghalaya where there is a rise in adolescence uh, child childbearing so we need to look at that point of view also right so one is the adolescent thing it is telling us about further it tells us that so we need to make them aware of the contraceptives so on that side it is telling us Second thing it says is that this management of this uh, initiatives of fert uh, fertility control of family planning, this knowledge should be percolated along the different districts of the country. Right. So this is their adolescence. I'm just writing age over here. Then actually I'd written down everything. It just got erased. So I, I have to. Yeah. Enhance the capacity building of the health workers. So it is the health workers who would be informing the people about the family planning and all that. So health workers, their capacity build has to be improved. They should be trained better. They should be uh, better informed so that they can inform the people better. And intersectionality. So intersectionality means that uh, different, you know, there is a tendency to focus on certain people as compared to the others, community wise, region wise religion wise class wise so that should not take place every section across the sections they should be provided the access to from family planning now let me add a perspective to this 
let me add a perspective over here so you see family planning that is control of population they there is a lot of emphasis on contraceptives right whichever way you say it contraceptives what is missing over here is that we need to focus on the people we are looking at people not people using contraceptives rather it should be focusing on the people itself and we by people we mean empowering the people improving the capacity of the people when the people are educated when people are made more aware when people are employed naturally the fertility rate will come down consider your situation yourself imagine how many children would you want in, in your course of time with the expenses in the urban environment no so fertility rate is coming down naturally so focus on the people the policies on the family planning are not focusing on the people it is not looking at it holistically that is an important shortcoming in our family planning policy so that has to be focused upon which i find missing here also next article engineering tomatoes to produce vitamin d okay great so in tomatoes are being engineered to pro promote uh, vitamin d and why vitamin d is needed it is needed for a process known as calcium homeo uh, homeostasis homeostasis i guess suppose you would have studied in geography so meaning uh, maintaining constant levels of calcium in the body and uh, vitamin d is required for the absorption of calcium okay so that is there now see what i want to do over here is i want to correlate this with micro hunger i'm not so interested in what is happening with the tomatoes over here but the issue of micro hunger also known as the invisible hunger i think in the next article i have this so it says that there are certain nutrients we may be eating cereals like our population is eating lot of cereals he says so we have we are much better on the hunger issue but the cereals is calories but there are so many other nutrients that are required in the body so that needs to be addressed so i have this unicef data of 2019 which says that 80% of adolescents suffer from hidden hunger that is those micronutrients are not there in the body or there, there is this shortage and naturally this has certain concerns like mortality morbidity feeling tired physical and mental defects etc etc and we are also having this problem of stunting stunting means the height remains less stunting wasting means being very thin according to your age height wasting so this is in one third of our children in in fact uh, if you want to know more about this you can study about the global hunger index and where does india rank so you can correlate this also now what can be done about it so one thing is biofortification so adding some nutrients uh, by the means of biotech uh, genetic engineering into the things like more population is eating rice so why don't why, why don't we add iron or zinc to it so the problem of um, amenia anemia that is there that can be solved right so such way okay so what is it saying so one is uh, fortification of commercial foods then uh, we need to focus on diversification of diets right and uh, giving supplements and obviously behavioral change so these are certain things that has to be done and we have this sustainable development goals uh, where india is committed to end all forms of hunger by 2030 and one form of hunger is invisible hunger micro hunger us to defend taiwan against china says president biden and these days the way things are we may say it is lol it nobody has credibility us has lost credibility i feel uh, with the ukraine incident and with the afghanist incident so us is losing losing that credibility but yes right now it has said this statement which is a very strong statement and uh, so it seems like a remarkable shift in their policy also but when they say this these days i don't think anybody is taking them seriously okay now when he state made the statement uh, president biden uh, so uh, when biden says the statement that china will not be invading into taiwan so a defense has come that uh, the U us president or the us stands firm on the yuan china policy 
So one China policy we should know. So look at this. This is uh, China and this is Taiwan. Now we should go, we, we would have to go a bit in the world history and the latest uh, world history uh, briefly. So before Mao, right, uh, Mao was there who moved, who had this communist movement and communist party was established. So before Mao, there was a kind of a democratic government, uh, democratic come military leadership under the KMT party. So uh, during this revolution that was led by Mao, uh, Chinese revolution, uh, during this time, Mao had prevailed and the KMT fled, KMT party fled to an island adjacent to China, known, which later came to be known as Taiwan. Fine, so this is there. So naturally China says that the, this is our territory, uh, which has now become Taiwan, which we not accept this. So any country who wants to have good relations with us will have to accept that there is one China policy, don't engage with Taiwan or at least no diplomatic relations. Countries do talk to them in some way or the other, but they do. They also say we are focused on the one China policy. That's quite complicated actually how they do it. Now the Taiwan people also, they say that uh, we are the, uh, when they form the government, they call, it, uh, call themselves that time KMT party, Republic of China. So China is known as People's Rep Republic of China and this is known as the Republic of China. <coughs> See it? So, and this is the one China policy, so which recognizes the PRC as a sole legal government of China and does not endorse, uh, yeah, this is the standoff of the USA that it does not endorse the PRC position that uh, Taiwan is part of uh, China. Right, so this is it. This uh, concludes our session, daily news analysis. So thank you for streaming in to our channel, IS Primers with me, Shivashish. So bye-bye, take care and all the best.